Hello there and welcome to my channel, Karth Ads, and I'm giving you some tips in terms of how to analyze literature. My full name is actually Kartheleen Kainya Adahar, and I've been teaching for almost 30 years now, and my major is English Literature. Oftentimes in school, we have been asked by our teacher to analyze some literary pieces, either for discussion in the classroom, or reporting, or some writing tasks. Let's have a review of the meaning of the word analysis. So it's actually breaking up the whole to discover the nature, proportion, function, and interrelationships of the parts. So you break up the whole, like you, if you have the entire poem, you have to break it up. Okay, so examine each line or each stanza. So the basic question is how do we analyze a literary piece and what are some tips? First, I would often say to my students, you have to read the literary piece ahead of time, at least more than once. Literature, like any other art form, is a dialogue between the artist or poet and viewer or reader. So as a reader of a literary piece, you have to discover what the poet is saying to us. Also, students would ask, should we discuss the life of the author before we are going to tackle his or her literary piece? You can have actually a brief discussion of the author's life, especially if his life or her life is connected to the work that he or she has written. But there shouldn't be a very lengthy discussion about it because your focus would be on the literary piece that is produced by that writer. So I said here, lengthy discussion about the author's life may not be necessary. Or if there is connection between the author's life and his or her work, you may mention it briefly. And this connection must also be proven by citing credible references. So you have to do your research. When we analyze a poem, for example, the first thing we will ask would be who is the speaker, okay? Or who is speaking in the poem? So for example, you have the poem written by Robert Browning. It's titled Porphyria's Lover. And then you have the first line of the poem or actually it's not the first line uh, it's in one of the lines in the poem i listened with heart fit to break when glided in porphyria a common mistake among students is that they would equate the i to the poet himself okay so they would say the speaker is robert browning okay so do not do that all right because if you examine the entire poem titled porphyria's lover actually the persona or the speaker in the poem killed porphyria but never in robert browning's life has he murdered anyone In the poem, the persona has strangled Porphyria using her hair. In real life, Browning did not kill anyone. So, always remember, the author is not necessarily the persona or the speaker in the poem. The author may be the persona or speaker if the work belongs to the romantic movement in English literature. The romantic movement spanned between the late 18th century and early 19th centuries. 
So you have these romantic writers. William Blake, William Wordsworth, John Keats, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, George Gordon, Lord Byron. Another question among students would be, is there such thing as correct interpretation? How do we answer that? I would say that it depends, okay? Now, let's take a look at this. It's an example of an incorrect statement. The short story of Edgar Allan Poe, The Casa Momentillado, is set in Italy. Okay, so if the student will say that, I would say that that is an incorrect interpretation or incorrect statement because if you read the story, it's never mentioned. The country, Italy, is never mentioned. However, you can just say in your interpretation that it may be set in Italy. And once you say that, you have to show proofs. You have to cite lines from the story that it is set in Italy. But as to saying it is set in Italy, that's wrong. Okay? Because the story does not specifically mention. It's only hinted at. Alright. In this line from, or in, in this um, short story, you have the character named Fortunato. And in your analysis, you would say, Fortunato is a foolish man. Alright. That's valid. However, you have to prove that through your analysis. What made you say that Fortunato in the story Casamo Montillado is a foolish man? So you have to go back to the text and examine or um, cite proofs. And in the classroom or in our online classes, it should be the students who will analyze or interpret the piece. It is not the teacher. The teacher is only the guide or facilitator. So the teacher can give you questions so that it will lead you to the interpretation of the literary piece. Alright, another question is on moral lesson. Probably when we were in our grade school, after we read a story or a poem, the teacher would ask, okay, what is the moral lesson? And we start answering, we should do this, we must do this. Okay, so please refrain from doing that because um, a poem or a short story may not present a moral lesson. Okay, unless if they are fables. If you remember fables, the, the ant and the grasshopper, the hare and the tortoise. Afterwards, you have a moral lesson like um, in the ant and grasshopper, you have to save when you are young or you have to save for the rainy days. Okay. So those are moral lessons, but poems, short stories, do not look for them because they may not be found in these pieces. Okay, so moral lesson is for fables only, but for the short stories, poems, novels, we call them theme. But remember that the theme is not expressed in just one word okay or um, you cannot say the theme of the story is love okay or you say the theme is love no do not say that because you have to ask the question what is it about love that this story is trying to tell me okay what message about love is conveyed in the literary piece So, if you say love can move mountains, love is unpredictable, okay, that can pass as theme. However, you have, again, to prove from the text, okay, from the lines. What, what makes you say that the whole piece talks about the unpredictability of love or um, the capability of love to move mountains? So, you have to go back to the text. And when you are analyzing a literary piece, assume that everything is important. 
and do not study details out of context. Okay? So, try to ask yourself, why is this line included? What is the function of this line to the entire text? So, here you have to take into consideration denotation and connotation. Denotation is the dictionary meaning or meanings of the word. However, connotations, what the word suggests beyond what it expresses. It's overtones of meaning. And it acquires these connotations by its past history and associations, by the way and the circumstances in which it has been used. So, for example, we have this house, okay? Or we just we say home, alright? So, home is a place where one lives. But its connotation would be what the, what a home suggests. So, it suggests security, love, comfort, family. So, that's the connotation. Or, what's the difference between the two, childlike and childish? So, both words would refer to characteristics of a child. But for the connotation of the word childlike, it can suggest meekness, innocence, while the word childish suggests pettiness, willfulness, and temper tantrum. So, um, you have to trace somehow um, the usage of that word and how it has uh, become um, used in the present or how it has been used in the present. And when you are also reading a piece so that you will have a good analysis of it, always imagine or visualize what you read. Consider imagery, the five senses, the sense of seeing, the sense of smell, the sense of hearing, the sense of taste, okay, or tasting. So consider them in the lines. And of course, figures of speech. You have to know the basic. Simile, metaphor, paradox, irony, okay, symbol, so that would be for another video. So again, imagery are the words that appeal to our senses. So when you have the line in the poem, clear blue sky, so it appeals to our sense of seeing or sight. Or when the poet mentions aroma of coffee, so that refers to smell. And, yeah, these figures of speech that I have mentioned earlier. So, you have this poem, The Golf Links by Sarah N. Cleghorn. Okay. So, there are only four lines, and I purposely didn't put any image here so that you can visualize what the poem is trying to tell us. The golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day, the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. So what are golf links? That could be the first question that you will ask. So golf links, that's the same as golf course. So, so um, that's where golf is played. So for basketball, you have the basketball court. For uh, tennis, again, you have the tennis court. For boxing, you have the ring, okay? So, golf links, that's where you play golf. And um, just the first line alone would tell us the location of the golf links. It's near the mill. But we are not told what type of mill. So, it leaves to our imagination. Is it sugar mill? Is it corn mill? Is it rice mill? So, it's not stated, okay? The second line, that almost every day, and then you have the third line, the laboring children can look out and see the men at play. Alright, so it basically presents to us an irony. The children are the ones working, while the men are the ones playing. 
So, it's an irony because in life, children are the ones who are supposed to play. And the men are supposed to be working, right? So, you have a contradiction. You have expectation versus reality. Alright. Then, you have the choice of words here of the poet laboring. She didn't use working, but she used the word laboring. And, you know, diction or choice of words is very important in, in poetry. Because the word laboring here um, makes us associate it to hard labor or even a mother who is in labor you have sweat and blood okay and you you um as they say when a mother is in labor um, her life is at risk so if you look at the children here they are laboring it must really be hard labor okay and children are supposed to go to school but here they are working and the word laboring is very strong okay so there you you are able to see a picture of what's going on and you see sarah cleghorn never said um the lines like i pity the children or what okay so poetry is like an image that is being presented to us okay then here you have the poem of jose garcia villa the emperor's new sonnet but you will be surprised because it's empty okay so why is it empty now in poetry another way to analyze it would be uh, to use your stock knowledge all right so try to recall was there a literary piece before that sounds like the emperor's new sonnet or try to think mm, there so you have recalled the emperor's new clothes but if a student or when you were still young, you were not able to read that, it's really problematic. Okay? You don't have that background, so you could not understand what this poem is all about. Because it's really empty. So just like the tale before, or yeah, fairy tale, the emperor's new clothes, the emperor paraded the streets and he had nothing on. He was not wearing any clothes. So just like this sonnet, it's empty okay <laughs> all right let's move on i'm of jose garcia villa it's titled the bashful one and you don't see anything except a comma so how do you analyze this so we look at the title bashful so what does bashful mean so somebody who is shy right so, I would say that you take a look at the position of a comma. If the comma were a person, what would be the posture of that person? For me, I would say that um, the comma looks like a shy person. Okay, like bowing. He could not stand up straight because he is shy. So, you see, poetry can also be very visual. All right, there are no words, but you see the image being presented. And of course, that's also subject to different interpretations. And that's for you now to prove. So if you disagree with me, that's all right, no problem. As long as you can prove your interpretation. Okay, and your interpretation will be based on the lines that you see. And there are many other ways to analyze a literary piece when you use the other theories or other approaches like biographical approach you have the historical approach you have the feminist or marxist approach you have the postmodern okay those are other ways of analyzing a literary piece but basically what i presented to you is more on the formalist or the new crit new criticism okay so, I hope that you like my uh, short discussion in relation to literary analysis, especially for beginners. So, don't forget to like and subscribe my channel. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my discussion. Till next time.